So the title of our study this morning is Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. The main body of our scriptures are going to be from Luke 19, verses 28 through 44, but we're going to be hopping around. So hopefully um, the scriptures will be on the screen. If they're not on the screen, that's okay. This will do our best, but I'm sure the sound booth has got that uh, all figured out. So, did Jesus have a problem with his identity? I'm just asking the question. I mean, it seems like a silly question, so maybe I shouldn't have answered it. Did he have a problem knowing who he was and who he is? No. It just seemed like those created in his image are the only ones who have that issue, who don't know who Jesus is, don't know who Jesus was, and don't know who Jesus claims uh, uh, that he, um, he is. And I think that's what I, I, I have hopes that we gleaned from our study this morning, is that the Jews should have known, right? Should have, could have known. They were waiting for the Messiah. They were waiting for uh, the Messiah to come onto the scene. They had uh, preconceived notions as to uh, what their Messiah should look like, would look like, and uh, has to look like. And in that, as they were now confronted on Palm Sunday, as Jesus, if you will, uh, publicly declared who he was, that didn't work well for a lot of the old school. Didn't work well for a lot of those that were grounded in tradition. Didn't work well for a lot of those folks who, uh, in their mind, they knew what their Messiah was to look like. And how dare anybody come forward and not match their expectations. And I think for a lot of us now transitioning into the New Testament times and those who are the redeemed. I think for a lot of us at times, we have expectations of Jesus. We have preconceived notions as to um, who our Lord and Savior is, um, who the Father is, who the Holy Spirit is. And as we go through life, at times that leads to disappointment. That leads to discouragement. That leads to moments of, well, if you're really who you say you are, and I'm really that special to you as you tell me I am, why is this going on in my life? Why is this happening? What's up with that? And I think what we forget is that we have been delivered from eternal death as his children. We haven't been delivered from the trials and tribulations within the world. We haven't been delivered from sickness. We haven't been delivered from poverty. We haven't been delivered through really the issues in life that sin in the garden fell upon us through. We haven't been delivered, per se, through those things. We've been delivered from eternal death unto eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is the one thing we need to hang on to, we need to uh, grasp, and we need to understand is that God so loved us that he has a place for us for all eternity. Absent those things. He has a place that we will be in <coughs> fellowship with him in the absence of tents that decay, in the absence of thoughts that distract. And as we go through our, our scriptures this morning, uh, we're going to end up in, in the place where Jesus, on, on, on a donkey, if you will, on, on a, a fool, if you will, whatever descriptive you want to use, uh, he, he reveals himself to those created in his image. And some bowed down, some got palm fronds, some understood for a moment what was going on, and others who uh, were leaders of uh, the Jewish church in that day, the Jewish people, they just simply didn't get it. They didn't get it because they were so focused on themselves. So I want to read from our scriptures this morning. 
And before I start reading from Isaiah, I want to say a few words. So God has spoken to us and continues to speak to us through the words of his prophet Isaiah. Isaiah spoke words of warning. Isaiah spoke words of exhortation as well as words of confrontation that what? They, they made him very unpopular in the day. They made him very unpopular in the day in the eyes of God's people. Does that sound familiar to us today? Sometimes we speak for the, the truth of who God is and what God um, would desire of us. And we're not looked upon as very, very loving people. Isaiah served our Lord from 739 BC to 681 BC and uh, much has changed since God spoke through his prophet Isaiah 2700 some years ago. Much has changed. But in the midst of that, something hasn't changed. So cultures and societal values have changed. World powers and rulers have changed. Innovations and technologies have changed. But there's three things that haven't changed. Man remains the same. We remain the same. Our need of a savior remains the same. And God's manner of reconciling us to himself remains the same. And it's amazing after all those years, those three remain the same. I want to read out of Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 12. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our inequities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep before cheers his silence, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. But because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yes, it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he has put him to grief. When you make a soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. For he shall bear the, their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. So in those scriptures, if they would have been paying attention, they would have gotten a picture of the Messiah to come. A picture that was completely different to one they had conjured up in their mind. To one that they brought forth that would satisfy them, yet leave them at the end of the day with nothing other than the figment of their imagination. Remembering what we had just read in Isaiah, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Scriptures in John 11 
Tell us of the Pharisees' plan to kill Jesus. So read out John 11, verses 49 through 52. And this is such a prophetic section of scripture for us. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. Or do you consider it, or consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not the whole nation should perish? And now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Such a huge dynamic section of scripture. Such a forthcoming of truth from those who perhaps didn't know the truth, yet it was a prophetic utterance. And for us in this day and age, so many times we understand what God has done in our life through the death of his son, Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ's resurrection. We understand the promise of eternal life that is yet to be experienced by us as we uh, leave this um, temporal place and, and go into eternity. And, and we can kind of part and parcel it together, but yet the reality is, is today is the day that we should be living our life to the fullest. No matter what condition we're in, no matter what state uh, our affairs are in, today is that day when we need to live in the enormity of God's love and Jesus' sacrifice for us. Does that make sense? And, and so many times we, we live as paupers amidst the kingdom. We live as those that um, really have no options and nobody to cry out to, yet, yet we know that we know that the Lord has a plan for us. We know that that plan is eternal. We know that um, God so loves, and we just have to grab that and, and, and embrace that. Next, I'm going to read out of Luke 23, verses 13 through 25. And uh, this is the portion of Scripture where uh, Pilate initially tried Jesus, found no fault in him, and then realizing that Jesus was a Galilean, uh, Pilate sent Jesus to Herod to be tried. Herod found no fault in Jesus as well, and Herod sent him back to Pilate. And these scriptures report the second time that Pilate examined Jesus. Luke 23, verses 13 through 25. Then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, he brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I found no fault in this man concerning those things which you accuse him of. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him, and indeed nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. And they all cried out at once, saying, Away with this man, and release to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them. But they shouted, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Then he said to them the third time, Why? What evil has he done? I found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and of the chief priests prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he released to them the one they requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison. But he delivered Jesus to their will. See, the incredible part of these scriptures is not how the rulers ruled. It's not how those who wanted the blood of Jesus cried out. The incredible part is, is that Jesus, coming to do the will of the Father, allowed all of this to happen. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus, God incarnate. Jesus, in his humanity, in his humanity still 
possessing deity, he allowed this to come upon himself. Have you ever thought of that? The love of God is such, the love of Jesus is such, the power of the Holy Spirit is such, that the God had allowed this to happen. All the meanwhile, really being able to, to get out of these things. Yet, the only way to reconcile us to God was through Jesus' death. And that death, as he became the propitiation for our sins, as he took upon himself that which utterly was crushing us, and he delivered us from that great body of evil. Have we ever thought that at any moment he could have said, yeah, yeah, I don't do that anymore. Yeah. I don't really care about those snails. They don't have to be reconciled to God. That's their issue, not mine. Never once, never once, Jesus said, Thy will be done. So as we enter into our teaching this morning, as we enter into Luke 19, verses 28 through 44, I want us to pay attention to a few things in, in the section of Scripture. Two disciples are going to be spoken of who were, were willing to do what Jesus instructed them to do. We're going to learn of a bunch of uh, disciples, a multitude, spreading their clothes on the road. And, and in essence, uh, Jesus receiving that. A multitude of disciples proclaiming Jesus as their Messiah and they celebrate him as such. And then last and not least, the Pharisees. Bunch of guys blinded by their own light. You ever run into people like that? You ever resemble people like that? I mean, you want to be so right, even though you know you're so wrong. You're just afraid to, to say, oh, okay, I was wrong. Forgive me. So you just got to perpetuate whatever you're involved in. And, and that's basically those of the Pharisees. For Jesus, it was you know, my way or the highway. It was Jesus, you know, you, you hit the road, Jack, because we don't want you back here no more, no more. And so as we go through these scriptures, hopefully these things will become evidence. Reading from Luke 19, 28 through 44, verses 28 through 32. When he had said this, he went ahead going up to Jerusalem, and it came to pass when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mount called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, that was Jesus speaking, Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you loosing it? Then say to them, Because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. You know, one of the most peculiar things, I'm trying to find a non-offending non word, for me as a person, not as a pastor, one of the sheep, is that when you ask something of someone, so as a person, not as a pastor, sometimes in the congregation, sometimes in the family, sometimes in the workplace, so I don't make it broad enough for everybody, and you, you ask something, the immediate thing you get is rebellion. The immediate thing is like, hey, can we go? Well, no, you don't understand. You don't know what's going on. Your depth of your intelligence, I can see, is not quite there. But let me instruct you as to the way that it should go. You run into people like that all the time, right? Like, bro, it's a simple question. Because I'm a simple guy. And like you said, I'm not complicated. So it didn't get complicated. And, and for me, the amazing part of what just happened here is that he told the boys to go do something. And the boys said, okay, no, I'm going, man. You gave me my marching orders, and I'm going. And no, I'm not advocating to go places that you know are dangerous or take instruction from those that, you know, are heretics or whatever. I'm not advocating that. But... But basically, two disciples, they were willing to do what Jesus told them to do. No questions asked. They were going to sit there and debate the program. They knew who asked them. They were going to go and, and do what was asked of them. 
verses 33 through 34. But as they were loosening the colt, the owners of it said to them, which, I mean, rightfully so in this day and age, we probably wouldn't be this kind and generous if we saw somebody taking our uh, colt. But the owner said, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, the Lord had need of him. So the other incredible nature of this is Jesus told them what to do. And they didn't say, well, you sure we're going to find something there? How do you know that? Come on, we don't want to go on a wild donkey chase, colt chase, are we? I mean, we got things to do. But they listened and they went. And then as they went, they found it just as Jesus said. Surprise, right? The person who owned this animal asked a simple question. Hey, what are you doing? Well, you know, Jesus has me. It's all yours. I mean, see the power of God in the midst of those created in his image and those that are willing to be obedient to his, his will for their life? I mean, to me, it's, it's just incredible. Verse 35 of our study this morning. Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. I want to cry when I think of that. I mean, the emotion that must have been present in the midst of these men and their Savior, Jesus Christ, as they brought this colt, this, this lowly animal, for the king of all to sit on. And then, what does it say further? They threw their own clothes on the colts as the only offering of something to shield his backside from the colt's top side. And it was all received in Jesus. As it said here, then they set Jesus upon him. Jesus didn't argue. Jesus didn't complain. He just didn't say, hey, no, I, I got it, man. You know what this is going to look like if anybody's watching us? Yeah, I can get on the, I can get on the cold on my own. I don't need no help. He received what was being offered. He took the only thing that they had to give, their clothes, their obedience, and their muscles to take and gently place him, my word, gently, on this cold. What an incredible picture for us, called to be servants. Us called to take the gospel to those who don't know the gospel. Uh, to those who absolutely don't have a clue what awaits them. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever had a discussion with somebody concerning Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? 99 and 9 tenths percent of the time, they don't want to talk to you because they don't know what awaits them. They have no clue what eternal death looks like. They have no clue that they're up and they got that ticket. They got that boarding ticket for eternal death. They got no clue because they can't have that clue. It's only through the mercy and the grace of God that they get that clue, much as we never had that clue. We didn't know we were marching straight to hell. Do not pass go, do not collect 200 bucks. But then through the grace of God, through faith, and what God has promised and done through his son, Jesus Christ, we came to know, yeah, there's, there's eternal hell. And there's eternal life. And I'm, I got the eternal life for us. So they threw their clothes on the coals. They sat Jesus on him. Verse 36. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. I am not thinking there was a Coles back in the day. Not advertising for Coles. I probably shouldn't have said that. But as long as they said that, there wasn't a Walmart, there wasn't a Penny's, or like, wherever you buy your clothes. You know, Dickies, I, I don't know wherever you buy your clothes. I mean, it wasn't like you could take your clothes, throw them on the road, throw them on the, the, the Colt, and like go down and, you know, order and wait for Amazon to show up. 
it, it just didn't happen. So this was a truly a sacrificial offering as we, we saw with the two. And now we see as many spread their clothes on the road. I want to read out of the gospel uh, according to John, John 12, verses 12 through 13. And this is where the, the Palm Sunday, the Palm Fronds come in. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. As those hearts cried out, recognizing him as the King of Israel, coming in the name of the Lord, and then others' hearts were hardened. And it's amazing how one action causes a reaction in others. I remember as a, as a perfectly good practicing pagan prior to the age of 31, as I embraced all that uh, the world had to offer me, and um, it uh, was good for me at the time because I simply did not know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And in that time, somebody would say the name Jesus Christ, and literally to me, it would be like a curse word. It would literally have that effect on me like a curse word does on me today. And I believe that was because inside I knew I was guilty of something, didn't know what I was guilty of, but I was guilty of something, and somebody was judging me, not knowing that somebody, but and, and just that, that, that effect on me. But, but as it says here, he went out and many spread their clothes. As it says in John 12, the cry when Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Some were blessed and others were hardened. Some were drawn close and some were repelled. And I'm so thankful on that day when I was 31 that God had mercy on me and I came to know him as my Lord and Savior. Best day of my life ever. Always will be. Will never change. Love my wife, love my kids, love everything. But no comparison to that day of salvation. No. Read now Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. See, Old Testament was not bereft of knowledge concerning the Messiah to come. It was there, and the men who were called at the time to bring uh, the scriptures, Old Testament scriptures, to God's people, most of them just didn't do what they'd been called to do. Read now verses 37 and 38. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of Mount, the, the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Shouting, rejoicing, speaking of the peace to come. If you know God, you have peace. If you have no God, you have no peace. And we know that as the redeemed. We know that weeping and what endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. We know that we're to live a life that's joyous in the Lord. And, and Jesus came, came to proclaim uh, who he was, who he is. Reading out of Psalm 118, verse 26, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. And once again, that whole aspect of crying out in unison, um, praising and rejoicing the Lord with a loud voice. As we close out our study this morning, uh, verses 39 and 40 and 41 to 44, and some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. So the Pharisees, the band of brothers who were doing what they wanted to do because it was best for them, not for 
those created in the image of God, not for the Old Testament worshipers, not for those who now see the revealing of Jesus Christ. Because these guys were going to lose power. These guys were going to lose everything if this was a reality. And as they cried out from the crowd to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Can you imagine a bunch of clowns rebuking and talking to Jesus in that manner? Man, if they would have known who they were talking to. And Jesus retorts to them. He says, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus Christ has the power to cause inanimate objects to have voices and cry out on his behalf? Well, if you don't, you need to go back and examine who your Lord and Savior is. You need to say what, see what it says in Colossians about Jesus. He has the power over everything. For him, by him, through him, all, him, all things were created and exist. If I want to go outside and there's a bunch of laughing, dancing plants out there, you know, I'm going to kind of go, man, this is weird. But I'm going to go, I, I wouldn't do that. I mean, I've never seen dancing, laughing plants, people. But, but God can do anything within his purview. And closing out in verses 41 through 44, now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, this is Jesus speaking, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. We, the redeemed, if you were the redeemed who's sitting in here, if you were the saved, if you were the called, if you were the chosen, whatever word you want to use, listen to what Jesus is saying to those in the scripture. I'm going to start over again. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this, your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. We are a special people. They are not hidden from our eyes. They are not hidden from our hearts. Holy Spirit illuminating and bringing forth the truth of God's word and his love for us. Not hidden from us, revealed to us, made known to us. Continuing in verse 43. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close in on you on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. National failure of the Jews to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, was disastrous and still is. What, what I would want us to take away um, from this morning's study as the worship team comes up is the importance of us knowing who Jesus Christ is and having the Holy Spirit within him and having God the Father orchestrating. And as the worship team comes up, this Sunday is a lead into Easter Sunday, which uh, we're going to have, we're going to celebrate next Sunday. We need to take seriously the love of God for us. We need to take seriously the calling of God in our lives. We need to take, and, and I'm not going to advocate for us to go out at the end of the day today and get in every bar in town. And go ahead. Yeah, I, I wouldn't do that. But <clears throat> there are plenty of places where the world hangs, where we're going to be. And in that, look for those opportunities. Look for those opportunities to live as light, as his light, to live as the redeemed, to take and jump in and bring forward the glory and the goodness of God. And I'm not going to tell you what I did yesterday, but, but what I did was, 
It was pretty interesting, pretty exciting, and pretty fun. And I was in the middle of a lot of stuff. But in the middle of a lot of stuff, you know, and, and I just trust God. I mean, it's not like, you know. So put the, put the word of God forward. It's like, amen. Now, it wasn't like everybody. It's like a small handful. It's like, okay, there's some seeds out there. We got this going on here. And so then you, you, you go forward and continue to do what you're going to do. And, and what I'm telling you is don't be shy about your salvation. Don't be shy about the Lord. If you're out to eat, my personal encouragement for you is, you know what? Pray for your meal. It doesn't have to be some long, loud, boisterous, obnoxious, you know, and Lord, I don't know why the rest of these pagans in here don't seek you. You know, I mean, just, you know, pray. They don't even have to hear you. Just bow your head, pray, ask the Lord to bless the meal, and that's a testimony. If you're out and about and somebody looks like they're having a bad day, hey, you know what? My wife and I are going to pray a little bit later on today. If you need anything, put up before the Lord in prayer. And sometimes we're like, no, I'm good. <laughs> Get out of here. Here's your bill. Get out of here. Um, but sometimes you'd be surprised as to the doors that open. See, the Jews had a God problem in their day, which turned into a Jesus problem in their day, which exists today. We don't have that problem. And so not having that problem, we need to bring forth the gospel, amen?